We're going to start off with the real basics on heavy-duty engine oil formulation. And those of you who've been through one of these before know that I like to have a formula. All right, so let's take a look at the heavy-duty engine oil formula. What is our heavy-duty motor oil made of? And if you've been through a few of these, you probably know the answer to this one. It's made of base oil and, an add and additives. Okay? Base oil is the slippery stuff. That's the main body of your lubricant, right? Your additives are things that are in that oil to either enhance the oil's performance or keep the oil from behaving badly when you don't want it to behave bad. All right? And we will take a moment or two with each of these two categories. Okay, heavy-duty engine oil, base oil. Base oil can be a mineral oil, the stuff that comes out of the ground with crude oil. You take your crude oil, you separate it apart, you take off the gasoline and your diesel fuel and your kerosene. You do the cleaning up and re rearrangement you need to do and you end up with the slippery stuff, the, vis the viscous stuff that becomes mineral oil for your base oil. You can also go to a synthetic base oil for your engine. We've talked about synthetics in a few of these sessions before. Synthetics are actually chemically structured. They're, it's, it's like breaking it down to building blocks and rebuilding it into a more perfect oil molecule okay? with fewer of the defects and getting it in the shape you want it so it behaves just like you want it. That's what a synthetic oil will do for you. Or you can blend these two to blend the two properties. You might want to do that because there are some great things that the perfect molecules of a synthetic bring you, but synthetics are expensive, right? So if you, but if you can get enough of the performance from the synthetic part and you got the cost savings from the mineral part, you can end up with a much more cost-effective product that really exceeds uh, what you would get otherwise with the mineral oil. So that's why synthetic blends are popular. And that's about all I'm going to say about base oils for now. Okay? Let's talk a little bit about the additive side of the equation. And if you've been in some of these classes before with heavy-duty engine oil, you've seen this list of additives. Uh, engine oils, in general, are one of the, if not the most additized lubricant that's made. Okay? Hydraulic oils have additives, but they've only got like a couple of these. Engine oils have lots of different additives and many of these in some pretty substantial quantity. And most of these additives are enhancing the performance. That's what we're trying to do here. So we won't, we won't beat all these into the ground just for you to know that there's a bunch of them there. And one of the things that people don't tell you about often enough is that because there are so many there, creating an engine oil is really a very careful scientific balancing act because you don't want one additive to counteract the effects of another additive or maybe these two additives ganging up on this additive and making your performance go the wrong way um, and it and that can happen too much of a good thing can turn out bad for you in the world of additives okay so that's the basic on formulation and then that's as much as I'm going to give you on heavy-duty engine oil formulation, at least, in, at least in today's presentation. Now we're going to shift over and take a look at the specifications behind heavy-duty engine oils. Okay? Now the specifications um, are largely defined and tested for by two major industry groups when it comes to heavy-duty engine oils. It's a little bit different picture with car engine oils, for instance, but heavy-duty engine oils Performance quality, how well it does, is guided by testing and definitions determined by the American Petroleum Institute, or API. And that's the term, the API service classifications. Comes from them. They've, they've, uh, they've got the structure on this, and I'll explain a little bit of that. The viscosity designation that comes on an, on an oil, the 15W40 is your viscosity designation, Viscosity is defined by the Society of Automotive Engineers. And they have their own sets of testing, uh, ASTM methods, and uh, protocols for how they determine the viscosity, what determines the viscosity of a given engine oil. So these two groups 
determine the overall, really guide the overall classification of how oils are set up. Taking a look at the performance classifications, and you may have seen this chart in a previous class before, this is the history of API service classifications. Okay, going back to the 50s, API service CA and CB. Okay, very basic stuff. Hardly any additive. Notice it's a very light duty kind of operation. Kind of what you expected in diesel engines back then. Over time, as duty cycles and horsepower and emissions have increased on engines, the oils have been formulated to change with them. The OEMs, the, the auto manufacturer industries work with the API to say, hey, we need a better oil out there. They undergo this project to develop better oil definitions, new testing or better testing or improved testing and come up with a new classification. And it's kind of marched its way, marched its way through time, each one improving over the prior generation, each one superseding. So if your engine originally called for a CF4, CJ4 met that and more. All right, so that's the, that's the service classification uh, history. The most recent API quality level is actually two levels, okay? When the last time they had a new classification come up, they kind of split it into part A and part B, if you will. They had two levels come up. The first was the API CK4, okay? CK4 continued, continued the line on that chart you saw before, okay? The last one we saw on the chart before was CJ4. Um, CK4 continued to improve it. We'll talk a little bit about what those improvements were. The other thing it did, though, part B, was this new category, this new idea of FA4, okay? And FA4 is the, uh, the unique one here. And these were uh, brought officially online at the very end of 2016. I think it was December of 2016. So it really essentially started with the 2017 model year and 27, uh, 2017, these products entering the market. Okay. Now these classifications came about, um, again, this is, off, this is uh, usually initiated by the engine builders. The engine OEMs um, go to the oil companies and go to the API and say, let's work, work and get this together. And these organizations are comp uh, love to create committees and subcommittees and sub-subcommittees to look into this. And so that's the kind of thing they would do. <coughs> the CK4 category was developed uh, with the uh, following improvements in mind. Um, improvements in shear stability, okay? So it hold together, stay in viscosity grade longer. Improvements in oxidation stability, right? Wouldn't gum up, wouldn't go bad. Uh, lower aeration, literally being able to expel air out of it, get rid of bubbles. And overall, be able to extend drain intervals. We talked about this a uh, couple sessions ago when we, when we had a session on extending drain intervals, that this was the key objective, um, a key objective behind the new CK4 classifications and all those other parts of the oils. Okay. Over on the FA4 side of things, FA4 met or meets all those same performance features of CK4, okay? the oxidation resistance, the lower aeration, the stay-in shear grade, all that stuff, plus improved fuel economy, okay? The OEM said to the oil makers, we need an oil to improve the fuel economy. We're trying to get better mileage out of our vehicles. All right, so that's the... Uh, that's the story of where FA4 comes from and how it differs from CK4. Now we'll talk in a little bit about how we go about doing that. Section two here and talk a little bit, we're going into the section about uh, um, engine oil and its relationship with fuel economy. And the key here, it all starts with this idea of 
of friction. Okay? So we're, I'm going to go back and we're going to talk about what friction is, what it means, and what we can do about it. This is a pretty good demonstration of friction at work between two solid surfaces. Okay? These surfaces, to the naked eye, may be very highly polished, but at some microscopic level, level they're going to be a series of these peaks and valleys. And when they're going back and forth, what's happening? The peaks are rubbing against each other, right? You can see that going on. Everybody has a pretty good intuitive idea that this idea of friction, I mean, this is, this is what makes you able to walk much easier on this carpet than on a sheet of ice, right? It's all about the friction. Okay. So the friction we're talking about with this peak-to-peak -peak interface can be categorized as what's called solid friction. We call it solid friction. It's between a couple of solid surfaces, right? And the surfaces rub together, right? All this is very, very intuitive here. Because they're rubbing together, they resist motion. They generate heat when they do rub against each other, right? That friction generates heat. And that can be an additional problem inside of an engine surface. These metal peaks going peak to peak generate enough heat that they actually weld together. Now there's enough momentum of the moving part that they're not stopping the part when they weld. These little small peaks weld, but the peaks weld and then it rips out a chunk of metal that's the rest of that peak. And now you've got a piece of wear debris going around and working on continuing this whole process of machining down your, your surface and wearing away your surface. So it generates heat and it generates wear. Okay, um, inside an engine, you can imagine this is not a desirable thing happening, and it got the opportunity to happen in lots of places inside an engine. So the friction points inside an engine might include between rings and liners, right? That's pretty, pretty obvious. We put some oil there to help, but that's still a friction place. Between a cam lobe and a follower, or a follower roller and the pin inside the roller. Um, bearings, particularly bearings at startup, uh, wrist pins, and something like a timing chain. Lo lots, of, lots of opportunity for this metal-to-metal -metal contact to go on inside an engine. Okay. Well, with, with talking about those types of interactions, that's all the solid friction, I want you to think about now about fluid friction. Now, we don't talk a whole lot about fluid friction, or we haven't in the, in, in the past. Usually the friction we're talking about is, is solid friction like this. Um, fluid friction is a little bit different. Fluid friction, in the case of a lubricating oil, comes about from molecules, oil molecules rubbing against each other. And you, you guys know that I'm a, I'm a chemical geek, and I like having all these pictures of these twisted chemical diagrams and these tinker toy models and these chains and arms coming off each other and and those molecules what they do in oil they're they're flowing all over each other and they're intertwining and and uh, I like the chemistry of it but I know that's hard to explain to people so we thought what can we show to get this idea of molecules and fluid friction that oh everybody could relate to This is, this is your analogy for fluid friction, for molecules going all over each other. A thing to note about fluid friction, this is a form of friction, but the total amount of friction is much, much lower than it is with solid friction. And that's, that's really the essence of lubrication itself, that in an engine or any other piece of equipment that we lubricate, we want to substitute fluid friction for solid friction. Okay? With, with fluid friction, we don't get wear. We don't get anywhere near as much heat. We don't get as the resistance to motion. Okay? So, so the, the objective of, of our industry <laughs> is to substitute fluid friction for solid friction. But 
the friction is still there. It is still friction. Can we reduce, can we reduce fluid friction? Well, let's consider that. Okay. We can go to our engine oil. Remember, we, the, the, o, the OEMs went to the oil companies and said, we need to reduce friction. We need to get oils with higher or better fuel mileage to them. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, maybe we can reduce the internal friction, the fluid friction of the oil itself. Hmm, how can we do that? Well, we got two ways actually that we can do that to reduce the fluid friction inside the oil itself. One is that we can lower the viscosity grade and the other is we can lower the high temp, high shear viscosity. That's what that HTHS is. All right, so we're going to take a look at each of these so they're not just words on a screen and hopefully uh, make, it, make it a little clearer for you. So let's take a look first here at, at looking at a lower viscosity grade, okay? Simply by going from something like a 10W40 oil to a 0W20 oil, okay? You're lowering the viscosity of the oil in your engine. You will be lowering the internal fluid friction. And when you lower that internal fluid friction, you actually get better fuel economy, okay? I mean, to think of it this way, is it easier to swim through a vat of honey or a pool of water, right? It's just going to be that much harder to swim through this thick stuff. And in this case, um, this is sometimes this, Im this kind of improvement due to just the change in viscosity itself is sometimes referred to as a change in low shear viscosity. And what this term comes from is how the viscosity is measured. It's measured at kind of this low flow rate, right? It's unstressed oil. If you remember, or if you were here, the last session, we, we had a picture of a viscometer up there, and we showed how that, that oil flowed through that little J-tube. And it's just under gravity. It's kind of taking its own time, and you measure it. That's considered a low shear situation. And improvements in low shear viscosity, that's what going from a 10W40 to a 0W20 would do for you. It's, it's thinner, there's less resistance, there's less fluid friction, you get better economy. Okay, so that's, that's part one of what we can do to get better fuel economy. Part two of what we can do is a lot more subtle than that. This is the thing that, that no one may have ever told you about. Or it, it's not like it's a great kept secret, but it just isn't often explained. And that's decreasing the high temperature, high shear viscosity. Remember, the other one was low shear. Now we're talking high shear. Okay? High temperature, high shear is a viscosity that's measured under more extreme conditions. Okay? And that's the key here. It's these more extreme conditions. Now, and if you remember, the, uh, the API does service classification decisions. The SAE measures viscosities. And they've measured this low shear viscosity and set up the low shear viscosity rules for, for years and years. But when this began to be an issue with the engine OEMs, they went to the SAE and said, you know, we need a method for measuring this high temperature, high shear viscosity phenomena. And so the SAE put together three subcommittees and what you came up with, and, and, and they told each of the subcommittees, hey, figure out how we're going to measure this high temperature, high shear. So what there are now are three different test methods for measuring HTHS, because each subcommittee invented their own machine. All right? This particular one over here um, takes, takes oil. Uh, in fact, high temperature, high shear, I think all the methods measure the viscosity instead of at 200 degrees F, which is the usual measurement, they crank it up to 300 F. Okay, there's your high temperature part of it. And then to high shear it, they pump it under high pressure through this little bitty capillary that's uh, 15 hundredths of a millimeter wide. Okay, 
And when you're forcing something through a small, small space, it's getting very highly sheared. That's how this particular machine works. The others use a slightly different technology, which is even more boring, so I won't get into that. But what you're trying to do is create a situation that's closer to the high friction situation in an engine. In all those engine places where we get metal to metal contact really possible, where we get really thin films. That's what we're trying to emulate right there. And you would think that under these highly stressed conditions, very thin films or thin amounts, that pretty much all oils would be the same. And the really interesting thing is they're not. Okay? Demonstrably different between the two. And what makes the two, what would make given two oils different? Well, one, it has to do with which base stocks you're using. Okay? I mean, even within the mineral oil family, depending on where the mineral oils might have came from and how they're chemically composed, they can give you different HTHS results. And then if you add in synthetics, we describe synthetics as a more perfect molecule, and it definitely shows up here. Synthetics can give you great HTHS results. All right? So that's one thing that can go towards making a different high temperature, high shear result. The other has to do with additive selection. Now, it's not every additive that you use, but a couple of the additives that were on that list will contribute to the high temperature, high shear viscosity at these limits. Okay. So, uh, so you, if you have to select your additives very carefully, if you want your additive to help improve your HTHS number, that's an important part of it. Okay, so we can get fuel economy now from two different ways. We can go to a different visgrade, and we can choose an oil with a lower HTHS value. Both of them, both of them will contribute. We'll have some numbers on what they, how much they contribute in a little bit here, but both of them do contribute. Okay, and since they're both going to contribute to fuel economy, that's good because we're going to save money, right? But we're going to have to do some trade-offs in order to save that money, right? Because there are some potential trade-offs we're looking at here. And the first people will come up with is cost. Because using the good base oil costs a little bit more money, right? We already said synthetics do the best job. Synthetic blends do a pretty good job too, right? But that's a trade-off. You're going to have to pay a little more for that. The same thing with the additives, okay? The additives that contribute, that do the best for you are rarer, they're not as common in the market, and are more expensive. So there is a little bit higher cost to some of these, these H, low HTHS oils. The other question that is probably in your mind and had been in mine when I first started hearing of this several years ago is durability. Okay, if you're using a thinner oil, you know, you're probably trading off some engine durability and some engine life. Or are you? Well, the answer may surprise you. Um, we will talk about that in the next section. Talk a little bit about these new low, um, these new high temperature, high shear oils out there. Okay, these are the fuel efficient oils also known in the category as the FA4 oils. Okay, this is the, the new, new kids on the block. And we'll talk about the, uh, we're gonna talk about, like I said, the market trends, the testing that's been done on these uh, for fuel efficiency, as well as the testing that's being done for durability. Okay, so the market adaptation of this, of FA4 oils. Remember, FA4 oils came out at the end of 2016, uh, beginning of 2017. Here's how much the market's adopted them. Okay? So far, it's been literally a drop in a bucket. Okay? Now, we, we've, we, do, see, we do see some growth. Um, as Tony had mentioned to me earlier today, if you look at growth on a percentage basis is good <laughs> because it's a small percent to another uh, a larger percent. But uh, a long way to go, although it is coming along, okay? Um, 
15 months ago, the last time we had one of these updates, I put this chart up here. This is the chart of all of the OEM guys and what their positions were at that time towards acceptance of CK4 and FA4. And if you look here, you'll see that everybody, everybody pretty much was happy with CK4. And CK4 market adoption has gone kind of seamlessly, right? Everybody's buying a CK4 15W40 or CK4 10W30 out there pretty regularly. If you look at the FA4 up here, you'll see that we've got some people who are saying in review and waffling and uh, we got some definite no's up here. Okay, well, let's see what has changed. Let's go for going for the updates here. Well, we have one update to report to you. Um, this is uh, from Ford in their small diesel engines. These are diesel engines going into F-150s. Um, they have approved the use of FA4. Otherwise, our OEMs have stayed the same. Not much change on the OEM chart. They're still, they're still uh, make it very clear by which model year that, uh, that they are accepting it if they are and whether or not they're going to accept it. All right, and that's about all I have to mention on the market update. Um, although I will say that there was, a, there was actually a conference last week in New Orleans where this was presented as a topic as to where the market is and, and, and its growth and why it isn't growing. Um, and the consensus seems to be that many people don't want to have two oils in their shop. Okay, a couple of reasons for that, but they don't want to have a CK4 oil for some engines and an FA4 oil for other engines. Uh, sometimes it's space constraints, sometimes it's concerned about getting one in the wrong engine, something like that, and so they're going to continue to run CK4 type products until the majority of their fleet, or until they get enough of them out there that can handle the FA4, that they think it's worth the, the, the um, economy savings that they're going to get from the FA4. All right, now I want to talk about some of the testing that Phillips 66 has been doing on these FA4 oils. Okay, and we've got testing in uh, a couple of categories here, or a couple of, uh, couple of areas. Um, um, one of them has to do with what kind of mileage improvement do you really get? What's really realistic and how can you, how can you measure it well? So the key here is on an accurate mileage improvement test. Um, there exists a, a test protocol out there that's been out there for years. It's, this is also actually done by the SAE and you, you set up, a, uh, you set up um, a professional driver on a closed course and you give them a structured acceleration and deceleration profile and they go around and do this and you, you measure your, your fuel consumption data as you do that. Um, but there's, you still end up with a fair amount of variance with that test method. So they wanted to see about doing better and getting better mileage results, particularly because the mileage results you get are not going to be, you know, 50% difference, right? It's, it's going to be in the small percentages. Um, the second thing we're going to talk about in terms of Phillips FA4 testing is uh, this durability idea. Is a thin oil up to the task, right? So I'm going to show you, share some results on some of that testing. And then third, I'm going to show you some results that they did when they put this product, this FA4 product, again the thin stuff, out in the field into some real fleets out there. All right, so we're going to go, we're going to start in talking about this, this fuel economy testing that they did. And what they really did is develop an, a new test method that I thought was pretty neat. Uh, and I, I just, as, as a science person, I really like what they've done here to improve the accuracy on this thing. So they started out, they, they did this on a Ford Transit van, okay, this has a, this has a diesel, diesel engine in it. Um, let's see, it's class four. The, the, the van style allows it good to be set up with all kinds of instrumentation in it, all right? 
that's, that's helpful. Um, so, it, so it'll work out well for them. And in the first part of this, okay, the first part of this test, they didn't just start running tests on it, but what they did is they, uh, they took it out and they set it up for input instrumentation, okay, for getting some speed data, um, uh, and some other data, and they, they gave it to a delivery fleet who's making deliveries in this stuff um, and had them drive it as they usually drive it, making their deliveries. So they used it in regular service and they gathered some speed data, they gathered the GPS data, they um, took you know, some temperatures, ran it for 20,000 miles of delivery service, delivering packages around town or whatever, whatever it was they were delivering. And they gathered all this information on how it was, how it was driven, how it accelerated, how it decelerated. And then in, uh, you take it back, and then in part two, um, you go ahead and take apart the data. You deconstruct it. How much acceleration? How much deceleration? How much time at this speed or in this speed range? How much time at this speed range? Okay? And you rebuild that into a structure, into a driving profile. Okay? Generate a driving profile that a driver can follow on a test track and, and follow it repeatedly. Then you go back to the van, and they installed more instrumentation, getting more detail, okay? This included um, temperatures on more things, like transmission fluids, uh, pressures like intake manifold pressure. Um, they got torque off the transmission. They built a custom sensor just to measure uh, torque on, from the torque plate and do very careful measurements of fuel flow. That's what that uh, electronics box over there is, the, the fuel flow measurement. So they got this van now loaded with, with all this instrumentation. All right. And then in stage three, they took it out to a place called the Transportation Research Center. Trans the, the TRC is in uh, northeastern Ohio, and it is the largest independently owned test track in the U.S. Okay. Um, and they ran it out there on their, uh, their 7.5 mile oval track again and again and again, okay? Now they did some initial running, and I won't show you the data here, but they did some initial running with some of the pro professional drivers out here, but decided that that really wasn't accurate enough. So they developed an automated driver for this thing. I mean, an automated, at least for doing the acceleration and deceleration part of it, okay? The part that's gonna affect the, um, affect the fuel economy, so they got some more repeatable and more realistic numbers. And uh, I didn't include this, but there's actually a comparison, some comparison data they have as to before and after, you know, manual driver versus automatic driver, and it's markedly different. This, is, this was a vast improvement, what they did in terms of the repeatability. And they ran two different engine oils as this test. They ran their 15, Gardol 15W40, the CK4 product, and then they ran the Triton FE 5W30, okay? That's the synthetic, F fuel efficient FA4 product. Okay, those were the two oils that were run in these comparisons. And they ran it for a year. Okay, this wasn't just a one week deal. Okay, they ran this stuff for a year, got loads and loads of data. So, so one can be pretty comfortable with, with the results. And what we had for results was, um, was this a weighted steady state and pretty much an average fuel efficiency improvement from 1540 to the, uh, to the uh, Triton FE product of 2%, okay? Scientifically, repeatably measured. And not just 2% improvement, but it was kind of interesting. Um, take a look at that. There's your mileage improvement was 2%, your overall. Some acceleration modes all right, some of the conditions in driving, you got up to 3.7%. And the real interesting implication here is that 3.7 is something that might be mimicked in garbage truck service. So if you have a lot of acceleration steps, stop and go, accelerate and go kind of thing, you actually can realize better improvements by going to that thinner oil. All right, so that's 
that was, uh, that was pretty impressive to see. And Phillips has taken this data, along with some other data that was, uh, um, had been generated at that same track and on some other engines, engine data, and came, came up with this chart, this idea of fuel economy savings as compared to a 15W40, okay? In a class six truck, if you were to go from a 15W40 to a synthetic FA4 530, you can get 3% improvement in mileage, okay? Depending on how much fuel you're going through, that, that can be a few bucks there. And even in a class eight truck, right? Just going to a 1030, this is still the CK4 product here, right? You're going from a 15W40 CK4 to a 1030 CK4, you're still getting 1% improvement in a class seven or eight truck, 1.5% improvement in class six, okay? So these are, these are some pretty good, pretty reliable numbers coming out of this kind of testing. All right, that's the, that's the fuel economy testing story here, okay? The next kind of testing we're gonna talk about is our durability, our wear testing, okay? Now this is a, this, this particular engine and this particular, the test I'm gonna tell you about is the DD13 um, scuffing test, okay? Done in a uh, Detroit diesel um, fired engine, okay? It's an ASTM method, D8074. It's a, uh, a requirement for uh, um, a, uh, FA4 as well as CK4, okay? It's done in the, uh, the, the engine it's done in is in the six cylinder 2010 Detroit diesel engine. And it's one of these tests that's very expensive to run because you have calibrated pistons and liners and all this kind of stuff that have to be used and used only once. Um, the thing is loaded with, with emission controls, make note of that. And here's how this test is structured, okay? The, the test is run for 30 hours, okay? So it's over a day continuously at something at about um, at about 50% throttle. And I know about 50% throttle doesn't sound very scientific and there is actually a scientific um, specific brake horsepower hour number that you go to, but it's about at 50%, okay? So that's run for 30 hours straight, okay? At 30 hours, you crank up the horsepower or excuse me, crank up the throttle and the load, okay? Now you're at about 80% throttle. And you run there from 30 hours to 200 hours, okay? The test is usually completely halted at the, at the 200 hour point, okay? That's how this test is run. And you're all the time you're measuring for scuffing. You're looking for cylinder scuffing in here. Okay, something to go wrong in the cylinder um, in, be in between the rings and, the, and the, the liner. Okay. They got a load on it, yes, yeah, yeah. Definitely a loaded test. Yeah, and you think that, that 200 hours is, that's eight days constant running by the time you're, you, if you get it going out that long. Pass is only 31 hours, okay, so that's, the 30 hours at that 50%, an additional hour at that 80%. It's a way to think about that. Okay, that's what, that's what the pass is. Okay. Again, that's loaded, right? Loaded, yep. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's take a look here at what some results came out at, okay, when they ran some of these tests. Okay. Take a look here. Gardol ECT, this is, a, this is the CK4 product, lasted 200 hours, lasted the duration of the test. Triton FE 530 made it to 200. That's a FA4 product, isn't it? Right? Gardol FE, another FA4, another one of these thin products, right? 200 hours. One of our favorite competitors, Mobile Delvac Super FE passed the test at 31 hours. All right, that's, that's substantially different. Now, 
Here's where show and tell comes in, folks. My good friend Tony brought these with him. The liners from this particular test are actually being utilized in a Phillips 66 training class. I think it's in, is it in Hartford? Hartford, Connecticut this week. Otherwise, we'd have the originals. So Tony made arrangements. Tony made arrangements to have uh, copies made by a 3D printer of the cylinders from the scuffing test from this particular run. Okay? So the Delvac Super FE 10W30 liner was like this at 31 hours. And I will pass this around, and if they don't make it around the room in time for you leave, look around, stay around afterwards and find it. Okay? But this is a, this is clearly a scuffed liner. You guys have probably seen may have seen some scuffed liners in your time. Okay. This is the Gardol FE 10W30. That's this guy. That's what this looked like at the end of the test. Okay, it's an FA4 product. No scuffing there. Okay. Now here's the punchline that we didn't show you. All right. When they were running this test and they got to 200 hours, they asked Tony what he wanted to do. So I'll keep it running. Okay. And they kept it running and they ran it some more. Well, it's still running. You know, what do you want to do? Well, keep it running. Okay. They eventually did stop it at 330 hours. Right? 30 hours. 330 hours. And it's still not scuffed. To me, that's a, and this, is, and this is not a bench test, this is a fired engine test, okay? This is, this is pretty impressive stuff, if you ask me, all right? On, again, on, both of these are FA4 oils, but this one's clearly doing something different. So I'll pass, let these get passed around, all right? And that's, that's, that's all part of the, the durability story of these oils. Now, the third... Phillips 66 testing that I want to bring to your attention is what they did with real-world fleet testing, okay? Um, um, they've, uh, uh, the, this, this, as I mentioned, this oil, or the FA4 classification came into being at the end of 2016, but oil companies had been working on this oil for years before that, and they had formulations developed long before that. And long before that, Phillips 66 arranged to get this into a number of, of uh, fleets for testing. Okay? Um, coming up next week, um, there is going to be an engine teardown from one of these fleets. It's a, going to be in a Volvo D13 engine that has 750,000 miles. Okay? I'm very curious to see what this Volvo with, that's been run since day one um, on FA4 oil looks like at 750,000. And one of the reasons I'm most curious is because if you remember that chart we had up here of all the uh, OEMs and what they did and didn't approve of, Volvo is one of the people that says, no FA4, we don't want it in our engines. And yet, we're taking apart an engine that's had no problems at all for 750,000 miles, and we're going to see what it looks like on the inside. So I'm very, I'm very intrigued, intrigued by that. Um, um, and, the, and, and this is not the only vehicle. Like I said, they've got several, uh, done much fleet testing going back in time. Um, 92 million miles logged on the Phillips 66 fleet testing on these, F, on these oils over a period of about six years, this amount of data, 335 trucks, okay? Uh, trucks representing, I mentioned Volvo, but we've got all the OEMs, all these various trucks, truck fleets have different trucks, so all OEM models have been represented in all regions of the USA, so it's not just somebody doing some flat land long haul, right? We've got all kinds of different distances, and climbs and uh, weather conditions are going through. Almost all of them on the FA4 10W30. Okay? 
that's that's the uh, the flagship that it was done on. I think some are some I'm sure on the uh, Triton 5W30. Um, um, documented teardowns. We've had a number of documented teardowns already, and uh, just like this Volvo one that's coming up. Um, and interestingly enough, for the entire duration, all of these fleets, because uh, all all the lab results that you know part of the fleet part of the deal Phillips sets up with these fleet owners is. We send you sample bottles, you send the samples to us, we, we analyze them in our lab, and we take a look at them. There have been no anomalies in the engines, there have been no engine failures over this entire fleet test over this period of time. It's just, it's, it's just been that much of a success. And I have some slides here from one of the teardowns. This was a 2014 Detroit diesel, a DD13, with 900,000 miles on it. Okay, just or just a smidge shy, 900,000 miles. Okay, main bearings, tops and bottoms. How's that look? Oil pan. Okay, a like new oil pan. This was the number one, number one uh, cylinder liner, cut in half. Uh, I had a whole. I know I know people's eyes will glaze over if I had all the pictures that they had that 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 Philip 66 had available to me. I just picked I picked out these as an example because I just I just think this is pretty impressive for a 900,000 mile engine. And Tony brought along another one of these too. This is this is the a 3D printing of one of these cutaways. In fact, it might be one of these pictures. Or it was from this engine. I don't know if it's one of these pictures or not. But you can. But I'll pass this around too. Again, uh, it's the actual 884,000. 2014. Okay, running FA4. All right. So a lot of confidence. Phillips has a lot of data, a lot of experience now. I mean, this goes back six years they've been running these things without any problems. Um, Phillips decided to do something about it. <coughs> now, we, we represent, um, we carry products from two major oil companies, from both Chevron and from Phillips 66. And both our suppliers, and I, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect the other major suppliers have something similar, but I don't know that. Uh, but both of these guys have a warranty program that warrants the, your engine uh, and their product, or their product in your engine, right? That the oil will perform as it's supposed to, and if there's an engine failure that was a problem with the oil, that they'll be, they'll be buying you a new engine. Okay, that's basically what it says in its, in its legalese term. Okay, that warranty. And both Chevron and Phillips has one of these. But Phillips had decided to supplement that to enforce the idea that their FA4 oils are that much better and that they believe in the durability provided from their FA4 oils. So what they've did, this, they've got this FA4 products warranty. Okay, and what they're going to do is they will, if you even if you start using this now, if your Detroit diesel engine is as old as 2010, they'll cover it. Okay, if your Cummins, or International, or Volvo, or Mack, or Packard engine is 2014 or newer, right? That's five years old or newer they'll also cover it. Even though, I showed you that chart up here earlier that said half of these guys won't cover it from 2019 forward, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's a, that, to me, this is a pretty bold statement to go back and say, hey, we believe enough in the durability of this FA4 product that we're gonna cover you even though your OEM doesn't believe in these oils. All right, and um, Chevron also has a warranty program. I'll put it up there because there's lots of words to it. But Chevron, to this stage, ha does not have any um, have any FA4 supplement the way that Philips does. Now, another thing that both of our our, uh, our suppliers have in common are these fuel economy calculators and calculating your fuel economy benefits in moving to a lower viscosity oil 
or moving to an FA lower viscosity FA4 type oil. Okay? So these are on their websites. If you go to the Dello website, you've got this calculator on there. You put in your number of trucks. You know, these are class eight, number of class eight trucks, your current average mile per gallon, the average you're paying per gallon of fuel, uh, and the miles driven per year, and it'll come out and tell you on which of their different oils how much money you might save. Okay? Pretty straightforward calculator. Phillips on their, their website, loweriscocity.com, has a similar calculator. You're putting in the same types of input data. Here you can choose whether you're in class 7, 8 or class 6 truck. And again, get what, go down here and find out what your savings would be with a particular product. If you want to get a little more detail and a little more accuracy, this calculator on the right is something that your Synergy rep can download and bring to you on their laptop. Okay? And this takes not only these factors into account, your price per gallon and your miles per year, but this will take in, um, for instance, how often you change your oil and what your crankcase capacity is. Okay? A little more detail, uh, which, how much you're paying for oil now. So it'll give you a little more detail as to how much you can save. And next up, what's, what's coming down the pike? What's the next heavy duty engine oil classification? Well, it doesn't take much of a crystal ball the, 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 to know that the first thing is that the, the last, the, the, the way the um, API does this is they have a proposed classification first. And once the proposed classification is finalized, they give it a name. And the last one was proposed classification 11 so the new one's going to be proposed classification 12. So I'm pretty comfortable in making that prediction. Um, it's actually not scheduled to really start work until 2021. And it's targeting the engine models that are expected to be out in 2027. Um, and most, most people are expecting um, uh, the following kinds of improvements, at least at this stage, as far as, as, as what's known out there. They're looking at the engines themselves, and so the oils will be supporting improvements in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they're looking at further reduced engine wear, and they're also paying attention to high temperature operation and high temperature tolerance. 